Oh. Okay, well, um, hello everyone. Thank you very much for uh, coming today. Um, Charles, is your, can you turn on your camera if you're there? Hey, Ryan, I'm here. Hey, Charles, uh, we can't actually see you. Can you turn on? Um, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, I'm trying to turn on my camera, but uh, no luck. You know what? I'm going to have to switch to another camera uh, because this one is fussy. I see. Okay. So give me a minute. Give me a minute. And I'll be with you. Sounds good. And um, I also want to welcome uh, Max. Hey. <laughs> How are you doing? Hey, good. Can, can you hear me okay? Or Yes, yeah. yes. All right. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you could uh, join us today. Yeah, me too. Do you want to just, since you're, you, you're new, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, sure, yeah. Um, uh, I'm just a dude that lives in uh, the Bay Area. <laughs> I <I've>, uh, <laughs> do a lot of uh, reading and um, like spiritual practices, sort of, I guess. Um, I don't know. I, I live an introverted sort of life and uh, came into Ken Wilber's work and uh, really fell in love with um, just the kind of uh, perspectives that he gave uh, on spiritual views and uh, sort of helped me with understanding what some of the masters were saying, I guess. And uh, it's kind of funny how uh, you know, the the messages can get uh, changed, you know, into rituals and all sorts of weird things. Um, and I think uh, Ken Wilber's perspective sort of helps. It can, I think it can, it can be an aid to helping to ground some of the spiritual ideas, which are, you know, beyond description, you know? Yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, uh, yeah, welcome, uh, welcome, Jeremy. Good to see you. Likewise, thanks, Ryan. Who else? Uh, oh, there we go, Charles. I think you have two of your cameras on. Somebody's got the uh, microphone feedback going on. There we go. I think it'll be better now. All You're right. There. Very good. So I thought. Um, uh, we can, well, you're still getting set up, Charles. I thought we could talk a little bit about what Crossfire is. I'm happy to see so many people joining us today. And I, I'll kind of give my initial pitch on what I, how I envision what this will be, what some of the ground rules are, what some of the goals uh, for this session and how it differs from a traditional first tier, like political debate, which this is certainly not going to be like that. And then I'd love to hear all of your input and, and let's see if we can uh, work towards something here. All right, let me see my notes. So, so basically, this is how I envision this. So this is basically a way that we can have, we can become comfortable exploring areas of difference and disagreement and uh, uh, um, mostly with uh, integral topics, but maybe we'll branch out and talk about other things eventually. And, um, it's a way for, for people to not only become comfortable with that, but to begin to really practice integral consciousness and embedding that into the way we think and the way we communicate with other people, especially if we have conflicts come up in real life with coworkers or family or friends. This is kind of a training ground so that we can begin to <clears throat> integrate our teal aspirations in with any kind of conflicts that appear in our, our life. And we're going to do that by training and Things like perspective taking uh, were aimed at mutual understanding, um, bringing the whole person into the discussion. So if something is very triggering or very activating for you, unlike in a, in a traditional orange kind of debate where there, there is only focus on the content, I, I see this being more holistic. So people can also share about why something is so personal, um, if it's, you know, kind of uh, you know, personal story or just a little bit more about you as well. Uh, you can bring that, you're welcome to bring that in. And also um, being able to share when your mind has been changed or open to a new perspective. And we want to celebrate that, right? 
Uh, in a traditional debate, if you say, hey, that's really a good point, you know, I'll have to go home and think about that. It's kind of like conceding defeat. And so this is that if, when someone says that, that's what we want. That is victory. And that's what we all want to celebrate together. And um, I thought I'd mention a little bit about the role of the moderator, which we can switch off for different discussions. I figured that for this first one, I, I would be the moderator. Um, and then we can switch as we continue on. And so uh, I, I see several rules, um, ground rules. And these are when, if these rules are violated, this is when the moderator would step in. So that would basically be <laughs> no ad hominems or, or personal attacks. But if people do get really angry and something does come up, I think it may be prudent to even explore that a little psychologically speaking. Like, you know, what's coming up for you? Like, why, I see there's a lot of energy behind this for you. What's, what's behind all of this? And maybe being able to get that in the open and share that so it can lead to some healing and, and transformation. Um, and also um, talking one at a time and, and not interrupting and being mindful of uh, not talking for too long at once. So if someone's going on a 10 minute monologue, I'll probably interrupt them and, and make them aware that you're talking uh, over your time. Um, and for this first debate we'll have today between uh, featuring Damiano and Charles, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, it'll be uh, uh, more of like a one-on-one -on -one discussion initially for the first, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes. Marcus, welcome. Uh, everyone, this is my friend, very good friend of mine, Marcus, who uh, is going to join us today. So um, it'll be it'll be a one-on-one -on -one initially, and then the peanut gallery will withhold commenting until so everyone can have their mic turned off. And then uh, after the debate is over, then people can chip in and contribute their thoughts. And I see that process of everyone contributing their thoughts as kind of the more creative aspect uh, of the debate. So through this through this process of a back and forth discussion, hopefully a new maybe even a new third perspective can emerge that transcends and includes both initial opposing perspectives. And so we can come to a more integral and enlightened holistic understanding of the thing. So that would be a more of a creative brainstorming phase. And we may not come to a, uh, a whole new agreement or a whole new way of, you know, a whole new perspective, but even just working towards that both and kind of mentality and a, and a pro pro mentality as it's called integrative thinking. I think that would be a good way to train us to think like that. So those are just my initial thoughts. Oh, I'll just also mention, and in the future debates, with, when we, I see discussion of some subjects that people may not want to do a one-on-one, -on -one, or it may not be um, people, it, it may just be better if we do a group discussion. And so I, I see for future ones, it will be more like a popcorn style about a controversial issue that everyone can chip in on, which there will definitely be disagreement and difference coming up in those topics, I guarantee it. But for this one, we'll start out with the one-on-one, -on -one, and then everyone can contribute after, after half an hour, 45 minutes. So, love to hear uh, any, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, Paul, you wanna say a few things? Um, yeah, I was just gonna say, cause obviously me and Ryan have kind of brainstormed quite a lot about this. So I was just gonna say like, um, I think like the, the crossfire thing, the thing we were brainstorming, it's kind of has a, a bigger um, holistic goal than just a debate like a debate is kind of like one flavor of of talking but it's kind of like the I think the idea we were talking about was like combining the best of like various ways of people relating to each other um, like kind of circling NBC um, debate like bringing kind of red and conflict and all this kind of stuff in and um, like there's so much down in the sort of the other different like stages for the the spiral and all this kind of stuff that it was almost like trying to integrate the various ways that um humans relate to each other so really like trying to bring an integral um thing to that so even though this one's a debate which i think is really valuable considering like um i think where sort of green and stuff struggles with red and all this kind of stuff it's it's bigger than that and also i think um it's a sort of ongoing process. So we're like really interested in people chipping in to give their ideas about um, ways of relating or sort of theorizing about the, the practice and all this kind of stuff. And um, I think one of the important things that, uh, I don't know if you'd, you'd agree, Ryan, but like um, one of the really important things was kind of emphasizing the we space. So 
kind of everybody coming together to build something that feels really sort of supportive and creative and um, evolutionary um, felt like a really a really important value to to have something that we all kind of like come together to rather than sort of um, th there's something about it that just feels like particularly integral and particularly sort of um, powerful. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, excellent, excellent points. I, I had uh, forgot to mention those. So yeah, wonderful. Thanks very much. Um, anyone else have any thoughts, hopes, dreams, fears? Go ahead. Um, I um, appreciate how Integral includes that conveyor belt sort of including perspectives in like a nested hierarchy. And um, so I feel curious about how to include that in debate where we're consciously pulling in perspectives from each of the tier and understanding their relationship to each other. That feels like a defining feature of an integral debate versus a traditional debate. But not quite sure how to do that. Maybe we can see what emerges. Yeah. One thought about that <clears throat> is I wonder if it's possible to the extent that we're aware to simply name what level or what I don't actually have a vocabulary for it yet, but what level or what uh, color we're coming at when we share something. So what level of nesting? Thank you. That's so kind of showing, uh, developing a certain sense of self-awareness around where you're coming from and, and making that explicit. Yeah, excellent, excellent and contribution. Thank I you. think that it also could be interesting as while you're talking, it's, it, it could be a little bit hard to reference what you're saying to a quadrant, a line or a state or something like that. But from outside, that may be easier to do. And I think personally, the value of these confrontations for me could be interesting to say, oh, we recognize that Damiano is speaking more from this perspective and he's speaking more from this one. And the misunderstandings may lie on specific differences. So I think that the value of having people looking is this possibility to, to document how different opinions about a subject could be referenced to these structures, because that could be something that that could be found similar elsewhere and be brought to facilitate conversations. Uh, yeah, Damiano, I actually, I really like that. And what's emerging from playing around with this is, um, an NVC version of um, honoring the level that someone else is speaking from when you step in to share your perspective. So rather than each of us having to be fully responsible for all the things and there's so much complexity, we can NVC reflect, oh, I appreciate your green perspective and I'd like to look at it from this perspective or take it in that new direction. And that way we're honoring each other and um, connecting through that building that we space while having our own individual opinions. That, that touches something for me, um, Natalie, which is, I think the shared leadership, like I, uh, I think like really wanting people to kind of like bring their, the things that they didn't know about, like that's actually something that I thought in reference to you, Natalie, because you're grounded in NBC um, and like circling and stuff like this. Like, I think there, there are so many like important ways of engaging with each other. I think it'd be like really awesome if everybody just chips in, like in any way, it sort of feels like you're all, um, you're all valuable. Like there's a, there's a lot to kind of like integrate and it's sort of like none of us can do it alone. Some of the uh, really interesting conversations that have been going on recently have just been with the uh, IDW community, the uh, so-called intellectual dark web um, and uh, I just really like how the conversation, I mean, to me, it's not even really, I, th I think part of what Paul, to me, what, what part of what Paul has, has said is um, reflected in the IDW community when um, you have these people talking in a certain civil way that allows for I guess, good ideas to happen because it's like, you know, Ben Shapiro will be talking with uh, Andrew Yang and uh, they can have a conversation. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm an Andrew Wang fan. Um, so I don't know. I, 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 see, I see that sort of happening in that community right now. Um, and uh, 
maybe we could sort of, you know, also participate in that way in that community here <laughs> because their conversations are so interesting and I've, 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 uh, I've wanted to contribute or something uh, to the, the dialogue that's going on across our whole planet, you know? So, yeah. yeah, thank you, Max. That reminds me too of another inspiration for this group is to model to the world of what a second tier, civil, enlightening, mutually enriching conversation debate looks like. So yeah, Yang 2020. Uh, Charles, um, was there something you wanted to say? Do I? There we go. There we go. Yeah, first I want to thank Ryan for, uh, you Ryan, for inviting me to take part in this. I'm, I'm quite excited about it. I thought originally it would just be you, me, and Damien, but now I see we have a whole rich cast of characters here to uh, add nuance and perspectives to our debate. That's wonderful. Um, there's a special reason why I'm feeling glad to be here, because I, I sense all, already, and that's been pretty easily to judge from the remarks that have been made, that I'm with an integral group here, folks. It's a place to get healed, and I'm needing a little healing today. Let me tell you why. Last night, um, I convened uh, a regular meeting of our White Rock Philosophers group. Um, I'm a moderator of actually three philosophy groups here at White Rock. This one has been the longest running for about maybe 16 years or so. And I've been moderator for about 13. And the, the conversations have uh, almost always been throughout the years, civil, rational, really interesting. And uh, it's quite a successful program. But last night, the wheels came off big time. One of the members of our group is, is a very opinionated uh, scientist. He's a brilliant guy, he's a physicist. And uh, he thinks uh, that physics for the last 50 or more years has been completely useless, pursuing pointless questions, lost in a labyrinth of mathematical formulas that relate to nothing. He doesn't believe the image of the black holes, that, that uh, the black hole that came out yesterday was all over the news. <laughs> So as you can imagine, this guy is a bit of a load to deal with sometimes. And uh, yesterday, his, uh, his asocial tendencies came out in a most dramatic way. Uh, he lost control of himself and, and um, started ranting and putting other speakers down, uh, defying my request for him to settle down, relax, and, and uh, you know, return to a state of, uh, of civility and, and um, exchange. So finally, uh, after several of those requests, I had to ask him politely to leave the room. Uh, he didn't. Uh, the group kind of chimed in and suggested ways that he could quiet down and so on. Uh, so we got through the evening somehow. And uh, and I was quite okay with how I, how I handled it because uh, although he called me a dictator <laughs> and, uh, and threatened to take his, his act and go home and never come back, <laughs> I, uh, I stayed calm and I held my ground and, and I explained to the, to the group once again about what kind of a moderator I am and why we need rules, and why part of the job of the moderator is to enforce the rules, because if you've got a group of 20 people, um, you need someone to direct traffic. And I told them that, uh, at, because they were worried I'd quit, right? they, they don't want me to quit. So I told them at the meeting next, next month, I'd be the same moderator that I was last night, and not to, not to worry about it. <laughs> so I'm... Uh, I'm less stressed out about it than I thought I would be, which is good, because the last time this happened was about four months ago, a uh, little different circumstances. I stressed about it for days. I don't think that'll happen this time. And that might have something to do with my hanging out with you integral folks. So I'm delighted to meet you all and to take part in this. So thanks for listening to me. 
thanks so much for sharing that, Charles. And, and also thank you for sharing a little bit about yourself um, in that and introducing yourself to the group in that way. And, and I just want to echo very, another very powerful point that you made and why I'm also inspired to start this group is, you know, dealing with conflict and, and dealing with difficult people, it can be really, you know, challenging and really stressful, as you had mentioned. And, and hopefully this is also a way to bring a lot of healing to that and, and for us to change our association with conflict and disagreement and, and having to deal with tense situations like that. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that this is a, a, a healing environment and, and being in the uh, bomb with other integrally minded people, I can understand how that'd be really uh, powerful. So thank you so much for, for being here, Charles. Um, and before we begin, if there's uh, anything else anyone wanted to add? Could I, no, could I mention something in relation to, to Charles um, that I shared? Like, um, I, th I think you were mentioning this more than me, Ryan, but like the, you were talking about an integral support group. Um, and like most of the faces on this call came together after a forum post that was titled, It's Lonely at the Top. Um, so it's, I, I, it just made me think of that, Charles, when you were talking about like it being like it being nice to to come together in the integral community. Like I think there's actually quite a lot of um, quite a fair amount of like loneliness in the integral community. So I just really thought of that when uh, when you mentioned it, and um, I guess that's probably like one of the one of the other like things in this whole like crossfire thing. I think. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, Matt. Just to comment uh, on something that Charles said. Um, yeah, uh, Eric Weinstein, um, Weinstein, I don't know how to say his name. He said like two things. That guy's a physicist too, and um, he was also complaining about a lot of the uh, not the th things that haven't happened in physics. Uh, I don't know. You know uh, something to do with the academic community and how the academic community is kind of weird these days with um, getting politics mixed into research. Um, so that, that was just kind of interesting. But he also said something um, which was that the conversation needs to be uh, guarded against sabot saboteurs. Um, so it's, it's almost like the conversation needs to be guided along and sort of kept uh, sharp in some way. Yeah, I, I'm hearing from the comments that uh, this is what I want in, in this group is that there's a lot of layers to what this can be and, and a lot of layers of meaning and, and uh, you know, what this space can provide for people on, on many different levels. So um, thank you for everyone's contribution and i just wanted to ask uh, my friend marcus marcus can you give like a 30 second intro like who you are and people can get a chance to know you sure hey everyone so i've been friends with ryan for three or four years we met in hawaii um, and i've been interested in kind of integral thought and theory um, for a little while now and i've been working kind of in social enterprise agriculture interested in transformative technology um, so i kind of want to sit in on this conversation and and observe but also see you know what resonates and also see what ryan's been up to you know i'm very curious to see what he's uh he's put together so thanks for allowing me to sit in i have to um probably leave you know by 10 40 so i won't be able to make the whole conversation but i really appreciate the opportunity to meet you guys and and be part of this thank you great thanks marcus glad you could uh glad you can make it and see what i have been up to or not been up to <laughs> all right so um well if there's nothing else uh before we begin I thought uh, we could move into the debate of the day, which is on a topic that it has a lot of philosophical uh, roots and contestation, which is topic of free will, which Damiano instigated in one of our calls. <laughs> so I, um, I thought maybe we can start with you, Damiano. You can first give a little introduction into what your understanding of free will is and what your position is on the subject. Um, so, uh, this, is, this is a subject that I'm quite passionate about. Uh, there is a possibility that I may actually like to be wrong about it, or at least a part of me may like to be wrong about it. Another one will staunchly defend it. 
Um, but my belief in the fact that free will does not exist, I'll say first what it is rooted in and then my sense of what would be a definition of free will on which we can base of discussion. Because if we have a misunderstanding on that, then the discussion is over and we may have solved it right away. So my, my basic point is that the idea of free will essentially breaks causality. And causality, cause and effect seems to be the underlying logic of how the universe works. Like I was reading, I was watching the, um, an audio book on the Course in Miracles. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It sounds very new agey, but it's actually a really interesting book. And at some point, it, there is this sort of the writer is speaking almost as if on behalf of spirit itself. And it says something that, that really struck me. It says, I cannot give you freedom. I cannot awaken you because if I did that, I would break causality, which also implies that the, the process itself of awakening is a process that has to be and is regulated by, by a set, series of processes of cause and effect. And my personal, let's say, attachment to the idea that there is no free will and that consciousness is completely driven by causality is that I believe that that gives us, and it's not an argument, it's just the reason why I like it, it gives us a lot of opportunity to play with it and use it as a tool for awakening, if we can understand the structure of consciousness itself. And I do believe, even if I haven't experienced that yet, that even though awakening may arise and you're awakened in a state of freedom and no cause and effect, then as soon as you are meeting the world, you need to play with the cause and effect and those processes will be enacted. And now to conclude, what I mean by free will is the idea that we can make decisions that have a sense, that have a meaning, that have a direction in life, but that are not driven by anything other than the, the decision and the desire to, to do so. And I, I do believe that that's impossible. I do believe that whatever we do is given by the fact that consciousness follows the path of least resistance. We have structures, we have things that we deem to be more logical. So even though we, have, we can find increasing levels of higher freedom, complete free will and acting in the world of form cannot coexist. This is my, I hope, I hope it was clear enough. This is my basic initial argument. Thank you, Damiano. And I just wanted to echo how I appreciated how you brought in, you shared a little bit of your personal story, your personal interest, you know, part of you is attached to it, part of you wants, yeah. to, you know, is hoping to be wrong. So awesome, that's <laughs> what we want to see. Charles, what's, uh, how about you? What's your definition of free will and what is your stance on the topic? Uh, Charles, turn on, turn, on your, uh, turn on your mic. I promise not to interrupt anybody. <clears throat> so, uh, Damien, I'm not quite clear on the, I mean, your basic point that consciousness is, is driven by causality. That, uh, I think I get that. Um, conscious events uh, proceed in a kind of a stream, one after another. If I sit with my thoughts, I'll see those thoughts change very quickly from one to another. And I don't, I don't fully understand the changes. I mean, why did I think of this at this particular moment? And then a different thought two moments later. Uh, uh, your, your point, I gather, is that this stream of consciousness is, uh, is a causal process. That is that there are, there are causes for each thought that pops into my mind and the next one and the next one and so on. So do I, do I have that? Uh, have I understood you on that point? Yes, perhaps, but probably, as you will argue, I'll be able to clarify my position better. But yes, so far. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, and that, that seems quite unobjectionable to me. I'm wondering about the connection between awakening and causality. Not, not quite clear on that. <clears throat> so what, what I meant is, uh, since we're in a spiritual environment, there may be this obvious idea that uh, enlightenment, awakening, the freedom from samsara produces free will. Uh, but I also do not believe that's the case. And I'm using that as a 
sort of um, our argument tool to create sort of an, an absurd scenario in which the mind is completely free from any identification. And thus, even then, whatever manifests, whatever happens, whatever we do, I believe to be uh, part of the stream of cause and effect. Okay, fair enough. Um, now, hearkening back to the Buddhist idea of dependent origination, uh, that I simply, I, I think that's just another way of stating the law of cause and effect. Basically, the idea is that everything that occurs uh, does so because of a set of pre-existing conditions. And the next occurrence uh, happens because of that, pre, uh, that preceding uh, set of conditions. And this is the way that uh, most philosophers and scientists describe determinism. Okay, so uh, people who believe uh, in determinism think that, uh, that the entire universe it, it unfolds according to dependent origination or is subject to the law of causality. Now, in the relative world of philosophy and science, usually that's the way uh, thinkers talk. They'll, they'll talk about cause and effect, they'll talk about the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology, and so on. And, uh, and they will say that everything that, that happens in human life is subject to those laws. Uh, we may think that we're free uh, when we make choices uh, of all kinds, um, but in fact, uh, that sense of freedom is an illusion. Uh, okay, so the the current the current debate makes a lot of of uh, neurobi uh, neurobiology and neuroscience. Uh, for example, Sam Harris uh, thinks that our, our decisions are uh, largely governed by events in the brain, which which may be random events. Uh, there are two scientists who investigated this by by experiments. Some of you probably know about these guys. One, one man was, uh, was Gray Walter, he was an uh, experimental uh, neuroscientist, I guess, uh, who conducted some experiments in the 60s to show that when people were deciding whether to push a button, that their, their action was actually preceded by uh, a phenomenon in the brain uh, called, um, well, what is it called? readiness potential. And readiness potential is a kind of burst of electrical activity that was associated with uh, decisions or actions like moving a finger to push a button. And uh, what the researchers discovered was that that, that um, electrical activity took place a fraction of a second before the individual uh, pressed the button. So that these experimental subjects thought that that the uh, machine, which, uh, which was just an old analog slide projector, uh, had precognition. <laughs> of course it didn't, because the, the experiment was rigged. Uh, the scientist had a direct connection between electrodes implanted in the, that part of the brain associated with finger movement and, and a wire connected to the, uh, to the slide projector. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the findings were, were considered to be important and interesting. And then another guy, um, uh, his name was Libet, L-I-B-E-T, I forget his first name, in the 80s, uh, performed similar uh, experiments with perhaps uh, a more... ...pretty much the same. Now, the interpretation of those experiments... Sorry, I couldn't hear you for a moment. I don't know if it was just me. If you could repeat oh. the last sentence, it, the, just the line broke off for a moment. Okay, everybody else, you're hearing me? Let's see what's happening. Now we hear okay. you well. Now we hear you well. Can you hear me? Yeah. Here you're fine. Yeah. Right, okay. Uh, my microphone is on. So, yeah, probably a glitch. Okay, so those are uh, two recent sets of experiments that seem to support the determinist uh, position. But, the, but first of all, the interpretation of what those experiments mean is controversial. For example, it could be that the um, readiness potential was set in motion by an unconscious mental process by which the individual uh, in, in 
that part of his mind, which he's not aware of, we're talking uh, upper left quadrant here, uh, that his subconscious was actually preparing for making the decision. And that would be invisible to the researcher as well as to the experimental subject. Anyway, that's, that's speculation then. I don't know whether that works or not. But uh, the more effective response to this is, uh, it seems to me, that uh, we're, we don't care very much about whether movements like uh, our fingers when touching a keyboard or a switch are determined 100% by brain activity or by activity of the whole organism. I like to bring in the whole organism. The brain just doesn't float out there, you know, doing things by itself. And of course, what goes on in the organism is affected by the environment and those conditions theoretically can be traced back to the Big Bang. So I have no, uh, no quarrel with that. Uh, my claim is that I don't care very much about whether movements like changing the slide uh, of a projector is uh, conditioned and, and completely determined by causal events in my brain and the environment and so on. I don't care about that at all. Um, other philosophers have commented on this. They've said, well, you know, that's not the kind of freedom that people are really consumed about. Okay, so what do we care about? Well, we care about the kinds of decisions, for example, at which university should I go to? I remember when I went through this process, it took weeks for me to figure out which university uh, I would go to. So there was a lot of thinking about it, looking through catalogs, sleeping on it, uh, boiling the list of possibilities down to a few universities, and maybe this one, maybe that one. Emotions were involved, a lot of factors. There was no instantaneous connection between readiness potential and the action to enroll in the university. So that kind of experiment I described was completely irrelevant to the kind of deliberative process that may stretch over hours, days, weeks, maybe even more, that lead to the decisions that we really care about, you know, whether, whether to marry this woman, uh, whether to take this kind of job, which, which university to go to. Those are the ones we want to believe we are free to make. And the scientific uh, evidence from, uh, ne from neurobiology doesn't touch that at all. So I'm going to stop here and give you folks a chance to react to that. Sorry, could you, could you elaborate this last point? Uh, I didn't understand quite whether you are stating that deliberate, conscious thought of decisions, such as the one you said about university, whether those are more undoubtedly uh, an expression of free will or not an expression of free will. Oh, okay, good point, uh, good question. Uh, yeah, what I'm suggesting is, is that uh, deliberative decisions of that sort, where we are consciously weighing options and alternatives, which appear to us to be real possibilities, you know, I could choose A or I could choose B, those are the ones on which we want to plant our flag of free will. Those are the kinds of decisions we want to say, um, I was free when I made that decision when I decided which university to go to, or when, uh, or, or when I decided to marry this gal rather than the other one. Okay, so that, that's where the significant debate will take place. So the question is, can I defend the view that those kinds of decisions, rational deliberative decisions are uh, in fact free decisions? So, so to be even more on the same page as we argue this, what would you, define as a similar decision that you would consider not free. So an example of an opposite decision where you say, no, in that decision, I did not have free will, not even freedom, but free will. Mm -hmm. Or is there such an instance where we do not have free will just so that we can oh, better yeah. understand the difference? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm quite happy to admit that most of the things that I do in my life are a product of habit. Now, you guys all know what habits are. They're patterns of behavior that build up from all sorts of influences, our parents, our schools, our 
our culture, our jobs, our environment, and so on. Uh, habits are great. I, I love most of my habits. Some of them I'd like to change. But uh, I'm quite willing to admit that most of what I do around my apartment, for example, the kinds of food I cook, uh, time of day I get up, uh, my routines, uh, morning, noon, and evening, those are a result of habit. I'm not deliberating about them. Those are not a result of anything like freedom of will. Although I feel free when I do them, right? I mean, nobody's holding a gun to, to tell me to choose the uh, orange juice in the morning instead of the grapefruit juice. So uh, I feel free. And I've not been diagnosed with any uh, psychoanalytic or uh, psychological uh, disorder of any significant kind. So I'm not feeling uh, compelled or obsessive about my choice of food from the refrigerator. So I feel totally free uh, making these choices, but I'm perfectly willing to accept that they are the results of my conditioning, the habits that have uh, developed okay. uh, over my life. So, but your, your argument then would be then when making a mindful, deliberate decision, um, you are acting out of free will because you are as free as you can be from conditionings and you're making a logical weighted conclusion. Is that, is that correct? Is that, is that correct representation of your argument? Um, not quite. I would not say when making those, those big uh, decisions that require rational deliberation are free of influences or conditioning. I would not say that at all. In fact, I probably better come out of the weeds here and admit that I am a determinist. Okay. And 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 I accept the doc as a, as a as a Buddhist of many years. I accept the doctrine of dependent origination, um, which is pretty much the same thing. All right. So, uh, what what kind of freedom am I talking about? Then? Exactly. I think that, I think that's the the key element on which we may have different definitions. All right. So here goes. Um, I love to introduce this by quoting Daniel Dennett. When he was asked once about his views on freedom, he, he asked, how free do you need to be? I, I love that question. Be because what it amounts to is, is saying, why are you concerned about this issue? What's in it for you? Uh, what, what, kind of, what kind of freedom is important to you and why? And when I ask myself this question, um, a number of, uh, well, a few answers come to mind. First of all, a lot of people want to believe they're free in a, in a, a very deep, profound sense because of um, uh, issues that they have around their conception of dignity. If they felt that they were completely, um, you know, swept along in their lives, by a process of, of uh, cause and events in their, you know, their brains, their environment, uh, and so on, they would, they would have a diminished sense of their, their dignity, uh, their humanity, their sense of their personhood uh, as, as being independent, uh, capable of running their own lives and being morally responsible. Can I, can I propose that maybe we, we have a second step of discussion where we discuss the consequences of accepting one or the other opinions. Because I think that this is also a, a really important area of discussion, which is, you know, is it empowering or is it disempowering? Because I, I would have the opposite argument to what you said. But if it's okay with you, I wanted to, for a moment, sort of uh, touch on the previous thing you discussed, because I think it refers to all the things we had so that we have like one, one discussion at a time. If it's okay with you. Mm. So if I can sense what may be the a potential point of agreement, but I may be wrong, is what you seem to be implying in what you're saying, or what I would interpret as my opinion as to what you're saying is, in making that decision, I was free. I did not have any biases that limited my well-being, my capacity to make the decision that was best for whoever involved. But that, that process was deterministic. To, to me, that is not an argument in favor of saying, well, that, that argument, that 
that decision was not deterministic because to me a decision is either random or deterministic that there's there isn't really any way in between and i interpret saying there is no such thing as free will as an argument in favor of determinism so that's what i mean by saying there is no free will what i mean is the universe is deterministic but what i hint from from what you're saying is this idea that in life we exercise different degrees of freedom and and i think that that's the path of consciousness like consciousness never quite finds absolute freedom if not in non-dual consciousness but there is always greater 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 levels of freedom and um what you have somehow equated before is saying something that i do mindlessly something that i do out of habit scratching my head may be the result of just conditioning i personally believe that also the decision you made about university is built on rational conditioning but is a more mindful decision where i exercise more whatever freedom i have to act within a deterministic world and push by determinism would you agree with this yeah and i i love the way you described that uh uh idea of degrees of freedom for example if we think of the spectrum of consciousness um we can look at look at the idea of uh freedom to uh freedom of capacity okay. and and that admits of degrees for example an infant doesn't have the capacity for language a newborn baby doesn't have the capacity for language that uh child that infant is not capable is not free to uh talk to its mom and dad using using a language it's yeah. too young right yeah. uh after you know a year and a half two years then it starts to develop so as the uh, as the individual grows through the various stages of development um he or she becomes more free to do more things that is uh, acquires more capacities to uh, to exercise musical aesthetic interpersonal moral and so on and uh that uh scope of of freedom increases with each higher level of development yeah so we're on the same page with that uh damian yeah so okay so, okay so you would agree in saying yeah. that a, a child has I, this is what, how i would frame it a child has less freedom than an adult but both are acting yes, within fantastic we came to our first agreement in yeah. a debate <laughs> and i think that this this speaks to the point of like the when we talk about free will i think we tend to define free will by what we want to preserve that is important and i think that for me intellectually what is important to preserve is not the idea that there is increasing states of freedom which i believe but the idea that there is just a foundational determinism that doesn't break the laws of physics but what i think it's a very interesting discussion to to segue from to have some more disagreement is is this idea that there is there is absolute determinism empowering or disempowering and as i mentioned at the beginning i find the idea of absolute determinism the most empowering like the thing that allows me to gain the most possible freedom because if i understand the rules of the game i can hack the rules of the game because the rules of the game imply that there is always higher degrees of freedom and i use causality to hack it so that that's why to me and and i think that many people feel that when they say ah there is no free will there is this sense of like okay what am i what i what am i going to do which on one part is good because we're nothing <laughs> our true identity is not that one ultimately but on the other hand it it just gives me hope that i can change myself i can edit myself i can um i realize how so many of the decisions i make are the fruit of self sabotage whether more unconscious or conscious or lack of information so thinking of my thinking allows me to have a deterministic approach to Uh, making it more alive happy and and freedom and this to me is a specific beef and this is like probably the core of my attachment to the argument is because i find that in in spirituality there is a lot of uh mythical belief 
we, we take the process of awakening as something that like, it just happens. Like the, you, you can't do anything to make it happen. And yet people seem to really do a lot of things to make it happen. So, and I think that there is, a, there is an intellectual laziness on the part of gurus to really understand what the hell happened between a jump to a state that has no cause. So this was can just I, to explain my, my personal bias about it. Uh, can but I depends, add, please. add something in here? Please. Uh, yeah, so I was just <clears throat> listening to some things here, and uh, uh, I wrote down some things. Um, one thing that came to mind was, uh, well, let me just start by saying that I, I don't believe in free will or determinism. Uh, so uh, you're disagreeing with both of us. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, I guess, <clears throat> um, so the, the thought that came to mind was, if you're not free, then you're a prisoner. If you are free, then you're alone. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, Max, I'll, I'll just say really quickly, too, that uh, this section was kind of supposed to be just Don Manuel and Charles, and I'll bring oh. you in like eight minutes, if that's okay. Right. Yeah. Hold the thought really quickly. My bad. Yeah, no problem. I just okay, wanted to uh, chime in. I'm out. <laughs> Sorry, guys. No, no, not to worry. So, uh, Ryan, we have about eight minutes, yeah? Yeah, around. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna cut to the chase here. Um, and everything I'm, uh, I'm gonna say here is within the uh, relative domain of existence, not the absolute. I'm, I'm not all that great on speaking from the absolute, uh, uh, you know, working on it, but uh, it, it's a hard slog, but the relative I'm familiar with. So what, what is the kind of uh, uh, freedom that I can talk about uh, in the same breath as acknowledging the deterministic uh, view of nature? By the way, probably should admit that uh, Nature is actually not entirely deterministic. Quantum mechanics tells us that, that at the very smallest level of reality, uh, nature is indeterministic. And we can talk about indeterminisms at, uh, at other levels as well. But on the level on which we live, this is, this is the, the, uh, uh, the domain of, of middle-sized physical objects in the universe who are capable of making choices, okay? Those are, those are facts. So um, when Dennett asked, what, what, how free do you need to be? Here, here's what I suggest. Freedom is important to us uh, in, in this world in which we live, in which we're involved with, with our uh, members of our culture and our society and all kinds of systems with whom we have to get along reasonably well and we have to function well in our societies. Um, the kind of freedom that's important is the freedom from coercion, number one, and freedom from compulsion. So two conditions. Um, when I'm making a decision, if I am not being uh, forced or prevented by an outside individual or force of some kind, that's one condition of, of the sort of freedom uh, that I need in order to uh, support the idea of free will. Okay, so when I was deciding to choose a university, I was getting no pressure from my family, for example, and nobody else. Nobody was trying to say, go here rather than there. So I felt pretty free to make the decision on my own. So there was no coercion. And um, as far as anybody could tell, I, I was in uh, you know, a perfectly normal frame of mind. Uh, I wasn't suffering from an obsessive compulsion or anything like that. I was able to take my time. Uh, in other words, uh, I would have been considered mentally healthy at the time. I'm quite sure of that. So those two conditions having prevailed, uh, my decision to choose the University of Toronto rather than, say, uh, the University of St. Louis uh, was a free decision. Okay. So um, that, that kind of freedom is often uh, it's actually part of the definition of what's called soft determinism or compatibilism. It's the kind of freedom of will that is completely compatible with, logically consistent with, a deterministic view of the cosmos. A free decision like the one I described 
um, I would not say was independent of causal conditions. It wasn't. It was just free of the kind of causal conditions that would, uh, that would make me feel unfree to make the decision I did. So I hope that helps. This kind of freedom then, let me put it in a nutshell. This kind of freedom of the will is the ability to act according to my rational desires. I think that I, the, the preface that you made about quantum physics is, it's, I think it's fitting to the argument that you just made in the sense that quantum physics, and, and some people are speculating that consciousness and, 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 and brain works more actually in line with, with the way quantum physics work than mechanicistic uh, sort of Newtonian physics. And the beauty of it is this idea that, yes, they're both like actually like in a sense, quantum physics never breaks causality. There's always time, there's always a cause and effect, but it's a wiggly cause and effect. It's, it's a wave that the difference. And when we look at nature, nature looks a little bit more like that. It, it makes sense. You can predict what nature does, but it doesn't do it like a computer it does it like a uh, tree. In a, in a, in a, it has, it has a, 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 an aliveness to it. And, the, this, and I think that that is a good sort of metaphor of what, show, what is an example of a uh, unfree determinism versus a free determinism, which is one in which you're acting like a computer, just very rough, immediate determinism, this, 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 and that. And that is either the world of the body, the, of, of physical matter, and the world of computers. And the world of alive things does not follow that role. The, the world of alive things is fluid and probabilistic. And that's why we see now artificial intelligence that is mimicking the brain, it doesn't work with standard algorithm. It works with probabilistic physics. So what I find what I, what I sh agree with what you say and tie into that is that it, it seems to me like whenever we're not acting like computers, but we're more acting like animals, plants, we're just, we're making lively decision. It's sort of like, you know, you, when you dance, you're still a produce of determinism, but you're having fun. That is a much more free decision. And I think that quantum physics may actually hold a key to a sense of what defines life which is anything that works on probabilistic or, or something that tends to work more on probabilistic terms rather than uh, merely uh, Newtonian ones. So that, that's it for me. Well, that was, um, thank you, both of you. That was an extremely fruitful uh, discussion. Some of it was far beyond my level of intellectual comprehension. But, um, I doubt that. <laughs> Um, but I, I just wanted to say I, I saw a lot of really excellent uh, communication skills being used there, clarifying, paraphrasing, coming to points of agreement, uh, being very clear and, and adding a lot of nuance to the conversation. So, uh, yeah, bravo. And uh, so I thought for the next half an hour, we can kind of bring in the rest of the group and explore people's thoughts and uh, on comments. And I'm going to use the bathroom and be right back. No, I submit that the decision Ryan just made is not entirely free. <laughs> um, physiological determinism was at work. I thought that was um, oh, that's a really good debate, especially for me, the last point about, I found it, I guess it was the, the complexity of talking about free will, that like outwardly it looks like, um, like Damian, you were talking about like kind of animals and life, that it looks as you know, there's like a complex decision going on and all this kind of stuff. And um, there's part of me that wonders about the way that people react to the idea of free will or not. Like I was actually kind of getting annoyed every time with this sort of lack of advocacy for free will, which is interesting. Like why would I do that? Why would a, a universe that's completely determined um, behave differently like that's one thing I think that come up that like you know if you believe in free will it's probably likely that you'll act differently and for me there was a thing about um, 
maybe you two can correct me if I'm wrong, that you're both basically at an absolute level determinist, deterministic, but on a relative level, you're sort of debating about um, how free will might express itself. So I kind of went to the whole form and formless that it makes sense to me when you look at the world of form that everything's deterministic. Um, but I was wondering about uh, about formlessness or emptiness or awareness. Like, does that have free will? Because um, in the traditions, there's a sort of thing of like, it's pure witnessing. It doesn't interact with the world and all this kind of stuff in a way. It just witnesses as is. But then there's also this teaching kind of that the world comes out of formlessness. So, you know, it's kind of like the Big Bang, like you out said, of emptiness. You said there is also, and, and then my, my line went off. You said there is also? The idea that things come out of formlessness. So on the one hand, the awareness is completely passive and is completely just witnessing stuff. And there's also a sort of teaching that it's free of the world in a way. Um, but then also that it, it actually form comes out of formlessness so it made me wonder like um if that if the duality or the belief that things are deterministic um because of that like whether then that's not a little bit like assuming something about the nature of emptiness or the nature of awareness when it seems to have the ability to actually create create worlds I will quickly comment on this because that's one of the notes that I took right before the uh, discussion, because I think that's, that in a sense would be the most challenging argument. To me, the most challenging argument is how does inspiration work, right? Like there are some people who can get into states where just insane stuff comes into their head, some to the point of almost channeling things. You know, if you, even Quentin Tarantino, he would say, I didn't invent the movies that I invented. They just came to me. Right? And that seems to imply a creative power that comes with accessing the state. Uh, I'm not sure what's behind that, but I, I do think that for the void to throw out something amazing, there has to be a vessel. There has to be a mind that is ready to understand those things and channel those things. So it is an interplay between the void and a vessel that can channel whatever is coming into a form of causality. Uh, but that, you know, if one could make an argument for free creation, probably that's the closest thing that comes to something that is just completely spontaneously manifesting, but makes sense. And, and the vessel that receives it is the, causality, the causal part that links it to the world of form. That's my take on, on this last point. I hope it makes any sense. I have a, a question to both of you. You say it's deterministic and the word of form is deterministic. So we are, the world is changing all the time. And who is determining how it is changing? Who is creating the determinism? <laughs> there is a likelihood. Sorry. Um, I have a little bit of something to contribute around this, which is around archetypes um, and the field of form and formlessness, where um, with, uh, what is the word with Sheldrake's book? Do you know Robert Sheldrake's? It's- um, Morphic fields, morphogenetic field. Morphogenetic fields, exactly. So in the field of potentiality, um, anything is possible. And as soon as we start to focus on one thing more than another, it starts to increase the likelihood of that come becoming more and more gross or more and more tangible and concrete. And the more that that happens, it creates a feedback loop into the archetypal field. And archetypal fields are things that are really stable. They don't change that much but the way that they're expressed is something that can change. And so I have a little um, drawing here of um, an archetypal alignment example of the mother. We have a positive and negative alignment. If you will, the, the archetype itself has like receptor sites, and this is just an image that we can use to understand something that's a lot less tangible, but there's these receptor sites. And um, so, 
we don't choose our archetypes. There's not a whole lot of free will in that. That's um, causes and conditions. But what we can choose is how open or closed those receptor sites are and how likely we are to engage in a positive or negative or some description of a way with, with those fields of form. And that changes the way that we think, um, the way that we perceive. And um, let's see here. So with the five aggregates, which is a concept in Buddhism, the five aggregates are the five functions of experience or grasping that gives us a human experience rather than just the absolute. Um, one is material form, the other is feeling or sensation that can be emotion or physical experience. Third is perception, um, the function of like noticing something. Fourth is dispositions and fifth is consciousness itself, that non-dual space. And so for the sake of this archetypal discussion and free will, there's really two that stand out that are more controllable by us as humans, um, which is sensation and dispositions. Sensation, we don't control as much. That's kind of coming from um, that subconscious archetypal alignment and um, dispositions we can control. And uh, neurobiology is a great example of a way to describe how we can change those dispositions. They, they really drive us, but like as we stack the cards of understanding the way that the deterministic game is played, we can change the likelihood of that habit to flow in a different direction slowly, slowly over time. Um, just dumped a bunch of information there. <laughs> what else is, is there? Um, yeah. Do you think um, I could add something here? Um, okay, so Heidi, I, I liked um, what you said there, um, and I think kind of what I'm trying to uh, point to relates to what you said, Heidi, um, <clears throat> and that's uh, that's that what I what I hear what you guys are kind of talking about is you're talking about freedom, uh, freedom existing in a relative sense in the future like um and 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 that's the thing it's it's in the future you you only have a certain amount of freedom and in the future you get more if you grow and i think that that's true but <clears throat> what it what it it's limited in the sense that it's relative freedom it's not absolute freedom um and so basically both the argument sounds like it, but I mean, it's, it sounds like determinism. Um, so, uh, free will. <clears throat> okay. So, well, like, like you said, um, earlier, Charles, um, how, you know, the, the argument gets kind of bogged down with, you know, watching how the brain, you know, made a decision before, the sense of self did. Uh, and so that, that proves this or that. Then you go down one more layer and then there's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and everything is probabilistic. And, um, and, and what, you know, quantum theory and, and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle basically says to me, uh, as I understand it, is that the observer can't be separated from the observed. You can't have a science experiment where you have some sort of witnessing of the, you know, of something, anything without there being a witnesser. And so it's like, that's the problem with materialism is it's like, it's like only looking at one part of the quadrants. It's like, it's only looking at, the external and Ken Welber says that uh, and is that there's not only an outside world but there's an inside world and the inside world is just as infinite as the outside world I mean if we go down lower and lower into more deeper and deeper physics we go down to quantum theory and then we go down to string theory it gets I mean it it it, it does it end does it stop is there a bottom 
or is it just completely infinite? So it's like we know things in a relative sense, but <clears throat> in the absolute sense, we know nothing. Um, so uh, the, the thing that I thought of earlier was if, if you're not free, you're a prisoner. If you are free, then you are alone. Can you really... <clears throat> Can you really accept either one of these things? Can you elaborate this last statement? What do you mean by alone? Yeah. Um, if you are free, then you are alone. <clears throat> um, so that means that you are God. If you're if you're free, then you are then you are God, and there's nothing for you to play with. There's no one else. There's nothing else. Uh, if you're not free, then God is your tormentor and you're in a prison, a matrix. Uh, so I, I think I think I think I think it can sort of be expanded a bit if we if we use the four quadrants and uh and, and look at how there's not only an external universe, a a, a relative universe. There's also an internal universe or an absolute universe. There's a universe that can be explained and there's a universe that can't be explained. Um, so there's, you know, we know, we know some things relatively, but in an absolute sense, we haven't figured it all out yet. So do we actually know anything? It's like, <laughs> uh, so I well, think this, I this, this actually brings one into the, the States and, uh, yeah, and I think that there's not just only an intellectual understanding of it, but there's also an experience of it. So there's 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 two there's two things happening at the same time. Yeah, what's up, Charles? Um, yeah, I'm glad you brought in the point about um, the inside, or what's sometimes called the interiors. Um, the determinists who uh, take part in public debates on this. Are, are always emphasizing the exteriors. They, they rely on the findings of science, neuroscience especially. Uh, and that's the exterior uh, aspect of the human being. But in the, in, in the interior, the upper left quadrant, we feel free most of the time. And that has to come for something. So um, I can choose right now to raise my left hand or my right hand. So I'm gonna raise my right hand, I'm right-handed. Uh, I'm free to do that. I'm also free to raise my left hand. Sorry, I don't care what the neuroscientists say. I don't, I don't really care what they say. Uh, I'm, I feel free and I am free when I do things like that. Because I thought about it, I consulted my desires and uh, I made a decision. Uh, if if the, the weight of opinion is that, yeah, but those actions had causal conditions in your brain, the rest of your body, the environment and history and so on, I don't care. And all I care about is uh, being free by my definition when I'm making decisions because that's the kind of freedom I need, uh, number one, to hold myself morally responsible and to hold others morally responsible and, uh, and the kind of freedom that's needed to justify our social institutions of, of justice and, uh, and punishment uh, for crimes. That's the only kind of freedom we need. We need, uh, to, we need for people to have the ability to act upon their desires. And if those desires are completely the result of conditioning, I'm okay with that. And in fact, I think that's true. Uh, a philosopher once said, yeah, we can choose our, we can choose our actions, uh, but we can't choose our desires. Those are a result of character formation over many years. And uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, deterministic arguments is um, that the believers in absolute freedom, that is the freedom from causality, uh, want to say that they can make decisions and perform actions that are completely unconnected with their character, completely unconnected with the stable uh, habits and, and uh, uh, predisposition and dispositions that develop over many years, uh, which allows people to know us and to be able to predict sometimes what we can do, to be able to rely on us and so on. That's what character is about, right? So uh, 
people who want absolute freedom want to be free from their own character, but how would that be different from a completely random occurrence? Since an action that was independent of my character, I wouldn't be able to predict because the only way I can predict myself is on the basis of my character, you know, what I know about myself and my habits. Okay. So uh, if I did perform an action that was completely out of character, I couldn't take credit for it. I couldn't have predicted it. It might even scare me, right? Because it is outside of character and probably scare other people. So it'd be like a bolt out of the blue and actions like that provide no anchor for judgments of moral responsibility. And if you experience too many of them, I'm afraid you'd be locked up in a mental institution. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think you're right. Really quickly, uh, Heidi, did you want to say something? Yeah, I wanted to say something. It's about the, the contraposition of uh, the right quadrants and the left quadrants. I think they are much more intertwined. There are um, studies who show that the final decisions often, it, it depends also a little bit on gender, uh, women often more do it on, on emotional basis and men often more on rational basis. But at the end, the final decision we do out of what we call intuition or something like this. It's, it's hardly ever that, you can see it now with the political thing, what is happening in, 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 in uh, in Europe, you know, and Brexit stuff, that is not rational. This is sort of, you know, everybody has his, his ideas and his feelings of how things should go. And um, I think we overvalue uh, the, the mental decisions in, in, in freedom. And then we also overvalue our ability to know what we are up to inside what our in uh, uh, our unconscious is uh, is doing inside of us so i don't know for me uh, free will exists in some way but i don't cannot say how it it, it exists uh, it is not a theoretical thing i could talk about and i when i still have the question you say you are deterministic uh, who is determining what you what what uh, the, the structures which you are following, you know, when you are a determinist, that implies that there is a structure which is determined and that's what's going to happen and what always has happened. So I'm asking, where does it come from? Uh, so I Heidi, yeah, go ahead. Could I, could I make a suggestion about about the structure, um, maybe there's some clarity needed, but like, it seems to me that there's a difference between an open debate and sort of asking Damiano and Charles a question. Um, like I felt a little bit while ago, it was sort of like, there were kind of like four questions slung their way, but they didn't really get the answer. Um, I don't know if that's, a, that's too uh, big, to que big to question. I don't, if, I don't know if you can help me out, Ryan, but sort of... I don't think we're we're going to all agree, you know? That's the thing. Like we don't need no, to convince think... each other anything. So it's like, yeah, we're just having a conversation about what we think to be the case and uh we all have different perspectives and um yeah. Yeah, but it's um it's it's sort of clarity around the kind of conversation we're having. Yeah, exactly. What 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 are the rules? You know, that's Orion. Do you want to have it as a debate, which which we had, and then we are asking questions, or do you want us to, to give our five cents to the topic? We can decide it before, I think. But how was it meant? Yeah, I I just I didn't have anything specific envisioned for this. I just thought it could be you can chip you can give your five cents, and if you want to ask questions, that's fine too. I just thought it was informal after uh, debrief. If I may suggest for next time, just, just process wise, it could be interesting to have maybe like a little bit of time reserved for questions that would better clarify the, the scope of the discussion to the speakers. Then a time for five cents about the subject from everybody. And then the last part would be interesting to discuss on the mechanics of the dialogue itself. So maybe, yeah. maybe today we don't have time, but to have like a meta discussion as to, so to bring us away from the topic and more into just how we discuss what we got from it 
and and that that's just my two cents as to yeah. how you do this next time as these three steps my yeah. additional to notes of some of the questions so if there is time in the end i will try to answer at least based on my my additional five cents would be that then our chat around it that could be on this in the sunday uh meetings the chat where everybody gives their own uh, ideas about that and we try to find uh the things, but I find it in the meta uh, con uh, observation. I find it better if we keep this in a in a discussion and with you, Ryan, or whoever is doing the the moderation. And then uh, we ask questions from the. And then at the end, as Damiano says, talk about the meta meta perspective. That's what I think would be good. Well, I'm quite okay with how things have gone today. Um, like Paul, I'm a little distressed that, that Heidi's question uh, didn't receive any comment. Your earlier question, uh, Heidi, about if, if the world is deterministic, well, who's, who's organizing all that? Um, you, seem, you seem to be assuming that there has to be a who behind the deterministic unfolding of nature. Uh, could this be similar to Aristotle's idea of the unmoved mover? If everything in nature is changing all the time, according to laws of cause and effect, there has to be an unmover, an unmoved mover. There has to be uh, an entity uh, that that is uh, not uh, dependent on pre-existing conditions. Is is that the kind of thing you're asking about? Yeah, I'm asking, it must not be a who, then that would lead to the idea of God. It is a what, you know, what, what is the, the basis of, of, let's say, the world or the universe? Where does it all come from? That is sort of an existential question. So I, 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 I will try to answer it just because when you asked the question, I got an insight that I, I personally found interesting. So I'll share it, hoping it may be useful. That, that there's this question of whether one can simulate the universe, right? Because the question is, if we, if we remove consciousness from the universe, does it keep going as it's going? And one could throw the argument that no, it, it, it would just fall down, not, not necessarily just because there isn't an observer, but there is just no purpose. And one could argue that everything we do, all that we do is somehow geared to get us to higher states of freedom, higher states of happiness, with, which in the end are a communion with this sense of spirit. So I cannot attest to what originates the original separation. It's likely that there is no original separation because the concept of time is dualistic. But it is likely that the existence of this freedom itself is absorbing consciousness towards itself getting higher and higher and higher degrees of freedom, but never quite hitting the spot. And it, it, I, it's a bit abstract, but I, I do feel that that makes sense. And I think that when we do feel free, do we feel free because the decision we do are free, or do we feel free because we deep down know that we are that in manifest self that naturally feels like that? Like, you, you could turn that around and, and really think, well, if you, if you took that sense that that sense that freedom exists there would be just no purpose to go anywhere but definitely one could say that there seems to be if you consider consciousness there seems to be something built into reality that naturally makes it evolve it just keeps going and going so it seems like somehow built into the algorithm at birth but i, I have a sense that this rejoining with consciousness seems to be the main point and to to comment on what Max had said, that freedom is loneliness, it, 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 I, I will give like a crappy interpretation without having had experience of these states, but there is this idea that there is, you know, there is a formless awakening where you awaken and you're just empty awareness and nothingness. And that's frankly pretty shitty. Like, you could be aesthetic as much as you like, but you've completely separated from the world, and it's a dualistic state. I don't, I, I don't know if it, there, if it's experienced as unpleasant. I think it's, no, I no, think no. actually, like pe people that experience it seem to. Nah, nah, experience I, I, I was just, I was just like making a joke. I mean, 
from the standpoint of where we are, that state is pretty scary because we lose all the cool stuff that we got attached until now. And then we're nothing, we're at best one thing and we're alone. But the thing is that there is a state, there should be a state after that, which is true non-dual consciousness, where the void is one with the form. Your Unity. Intention, yeah, like your intention, your actions seem to be somehow one with it. And I hope that in that state, there's just a lot more fun. Well, I mean... That would be the answer to that. I guess you, you start from where you are and you keep going, but... Uh... But Natalie, I know she's wanted to say something for a while, haven't you? You, you looked like you were trying to raise your hand or something. Well, I wanted to reinforce what Heidi was saying about um, form and formlessness that, that Charles was touching on too with um, our interior experience being um, somewhat neglected in lieu of the deterministic mental choices that we make being a part of free will. And I feel like our interior, like our physical experience is so aligned with that bigger archetypal field that is the um, bridge between formless and form and our body sensations um, touch directly into that bridge there. And so there's, um, Again, there's there's not a lot of choice about what we choose. What what is it? Someone said earlier. Um, we can choose our actions, but we don't choose how we feel. And it's that that bridge between of the archetype between the form and the formlessness and the body sensations. We we don't choose how we feel, but we can choose how we respond to those physical sensations that are happening here. And the more that we can notice, the more nuance that we can come in touch with there, it increases our freedom, it increases our free will, it increases our ability to work with actions and emotions before they blow up to the form of like negative anger. We can work with positive anger and be more, more aligned in a deeper way. So just to uh, jump in here, it's 11.28 of my time. And I scheduled this for an hour and a half, so we have a couple minutes left um, in which I wanted to touch on a few uh, housekeeping things, including um, hour and a half. I just put it in an hour and a half because that's what we did on Sunday. I'm just wondering if that's too short, too long. Do people want to talk a little bit more? How is that for people? And, um, and also, Jeremy, I know you didn't say anything the whole time, so if, I want to give you a chance to before the close if you had something to say. Sorry, I, I was making lunch for myself and listening to you guys, so I didn't want to um, bring in a lot of noise. Um, yeah, I, I uh, first of all, just responding to your comment, I think 90 minutes is pretty good. Um, I, I know it's a little tight, but I think that kind of energizes the discussion and kind of gets us to, to keep coming back to the topic. Um, and, and just knowing from my own workload, 90 minutes is pretty much what I can give something in a day, you know, in a busy day. So, so I think it's a good time chunk. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, the philosophy of freedom and free will is really interesting. Like Rudolf Steiner talks about that um, in one of his earlier books. And um, it's something I'm interested in too, just because it's such a central um, uh, uh, orientation in Gepser's approach where he's describing the nature of an integral human being as, as being free from the world and then free for the world as in um i think he and this is something to consider too in terms of dependent origination and the subjects we've been discussing today uh, uh in terms of determinism um that perhaps freedom in that sense of that luminous expanse that luminous creative void that opens up um the capacity of the human being to realize that consciously is to the degree of free will that we actually have. That free will is not something that's created separately from, uh, created in that rift, but is actually kind of created in this sort of conscious integration with what brings things into being. Um, so that, that's just like a brief micro comment that I've, I've just been kind of thinking about as we've been talking about freedom and, and, and circling around these contemplative insights about freedom, because it's a very interesting um, thing to consider. The, the second thing is um, uh, some commentary on dependent origination and cause. I'm thinking of a lot of 
pre-modern philosophical debates on, on um, the nature of how the world was determined, right? Like there's, it used to be God being the first cause, right? You, you need a first cause. You need this kind of sequence of causal events that kind of emanate and bring things into being. So um, I don't have anything else about that except to bring that up, but uh, dependent origination, I, I've always kind of seen that a little bit differently rather than like a, a, a string of causes. Um, for me, it's been more of a kind of a systems view of how we're determined by these feedback loops that are constantly circling and, and creating these conditions that are sort of forming the assemblage of the self that is kind of arising out of this sort of ecology of conditions that are, that are imprinting us and, and creating us and formulating us. So that's it. It's not really a debate or I don't have any debate, just sort of comments as we've been going along, really interesting discussion. So I appreciate what you guys have been bringing uh, bring to this today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Great, great uh, things to chew on. Uh, and Paul, do you want to get your closing pitch thing? Yeah, I was wondering if um, everybody basically might like to do like a checkout. Um, so basically, your stance on free will, um, and also your experience of the the group, the group dynamic, the debate, um, what you liked, what you didn't like, and all that kind of stuff, I think is sort of um, can make the experience feel a little bit like more meaningful when there's that kind of like giving back rather than kind of like, oh yeah, some stuff was said, let's just, now I'm going to leave and like eat dinner or something. Great. So yeah, so a closing checkout and also everyone gives kind of a micro summary of their position on the subject and also their experience of the call and, and the group dynamic in the call. So yeah, who wants to, uh, I'll, just, I'll just start since I'm already on. I just want to thank everyone so much. And um, I didn't have a lot planned for this first one because I figured we'd iron out the details in email, like, even including like how often we want to do this. And uh, I just want to thank Damiano and Charles. That was awesome. You guys, I'm going to rewatch this like three, four, maybe five times. Um, and uh, my, my, just my closing on the, this free will thing is, um, to be honest, like kind of like what Charles was saying, I don't really care if it exists or not. I'm just doing my thing. But I would say I have an integral perspective in which it exists and it doesn't in degrees, whether you look at it from a third person perspective or a first person perspective. And um, yeah, this, uh, thank you so much, everyone. And I, I just want to say too that before the call started, I could feel this kind of energy, this buzz around this call that I don't feel in other calls. And it may be because of the whole crossfire vibe and that's exactly what I wanted and what I wanted to get at. So thank you everyone and um, that's me. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to appreciate uh, you, Ryan, for, for moderating it. Um, it's been like so fun, like me and Ryan have talked quite a lot about this thing and then to actually watch it come alive and be like unpredictable. And I think I would have been too nervous and kind of a bit, um, I don't know, too sort of in my primal body to properly moderate. So I appreciate that. And, um, also like, um, I'm having an appreciation of sort of, I guess what I would call a bit of like a, a blend of like green an orange like the i was appreciating uh damiano and charles like the debate you have but also i think just getting like a flavor of your your personalities as well um coming through it feels like a nice touch and also um with the whole the whole crossfire thing just kind of appreciating how complex it is like in every there are so many choices and so many ways of relating it was sort of fun to be on that that knife edge um so yeah, I appreciate everybody's um, participation. For me on the free world, there's something around, um, I almost feel like I kind of want to, <laughs> I wish I had more time to answer, ask the question, but the thing about form and formlessness, like um, whether or not they're like pure awareness has free will and whether or not I have a stake in um, that, that awareness. Um, I was thinking about Max of like, in some ways, if you're God, then you're lonely. You, you're totally alone. But, and I think the other flip side could just as easily be said that you're um, more connected because if you're God, then you're connected with the, everything yeah. else. And there's this duality that exists. But basically, um, I find the idea kind of captivating about if I have, if there's an interaction between myself and pure witnessing um, that sparks me, because it kind of almost feels a bit like that kind of finger reaching for God, like, is there an interaction between form and formlessness? And can I control my 
awareness to an extent because it seems to me that all the arguments other than that are kind of relative even though they're they're really important but if if there is an ability to be able to move one's awareness um there's part of me that feels like you could possibly argue for an absolute sense of free will in in that even though i don't know exactly what that is uh, just as a concept and as an experience so um uh, yeah yeah that, that's me Okay, I'll take a turn here. Uh, I, I like this format. I, I think it's worked just fine today. I've liked it a lot. Thanks very much to you, Ryan, for organizing this. And the length of time, an hour and a half, is fine with me too. So I'd, I'd be delighted to participate in a conversation like this again in the future. My parting thought would be this. That the conversation seems to me uh, has taken place on, on two levels. Now, I was coming from what's often called the relative level uh, of uh, awareness and thought, which is philosophical, sort of standard mainline philosophical, where the question is, in what sense are we free when we make decisions about to do this or that in the real world? And, uh, and the, other, the other plane on, on which the conversation was taking place was, was uh, of the absolute. And uh, there was uh, talk about emptiness, and I was particularly struck by Heidi's a comment about the archetypes being sort of the connection between emptiness and form, between formlessness and form. Uh, I'm going to think about that. That's that's a new thought for me. Um, the the reason I used I used to believe in metaphysical freedom or absolute freedom, the ability to be free in a not in a Buddhist sense, but but in uh, an ordinary relative sense from the chain of causality that constitutes the universe. But then when I started to think, do, do I really believe, could I, do I really believe that there are exceptions to the law of cause and effect? I had to say, no, there's, there's no way I can believe that, uh, if, that some events in the world don't have causal conditions. I, I cannot get myself to believe that such events occur. And so that's when I had to think differently about free will because I believed in that too. So my position is called compatibilism. I think that uh, a conception of free will, which is important to all of us, is compatible with determinism in the way I've tried to explain today. So thanks a lot, guys. I feel like I've healed up quite a bit in the last hour and a half. And thanks to you, Damien, for being a worthy and articulate uh, adversary, although I'll, I'll soften the edges of that word adversary because uh, it was just a great exchange. So thanks a lot. Yeah, um, maybe I could just say um, that I appreciate all you guys uh, having this cool conversation. You know, we're talking about philosophy and spirituality and you know, uh, reality. Um, these are just such interesting, it's just such an interesting way to spend time, you know, to um, sort of celebrate this miraculous thing um, called life. Um, but yeah, uh, the, my position is that <laughs> I really don't know. And uh, I don't know that it can be known. And in some way, I feel that there's just like a uh, determinism is like, um, it's like we're held in infinite determinism. And that's like pure guiltlessness. And that's an amazing thing. And at the same time, we're given the miracle of creation, of being a creator, of having perfect freedom. And uh, that's... Um, that's where I stand. <laughs> uh, also, for me, it was really amazing. Uh, I was a bit nervous to be among the first to be to be doing this, but it was wonderful. Thank you a lot, Charles. It was a wonderful discussion, and thanks Ryan and Paul for organizing it. Uh, I really would like to see more of this. I think that when there is an argument to be debated 
it's just easier to get to the core of things. And I think also in the Sunday calls, like launching not just a topic, but you know, a position that we could wrestle with, I think would, would be helpful. I find this almost like a meditative practice that allows you to sustain rationally also states and things. So it, it's like a medita- it's like really an integral meditation. Yeah. And, and, and I, I'm really thankful, Max, I think that the, the kind of point that you, points that you raised points at the parts of the argument that we can't quite explain rationally, but I am left with a sense of curiosity if one is truly able to have a truly non-dual state of void and form together, uh, I do have an intuition that, that, that the answer to all this would be completely different and it would be probably a third option. It would be something entirely unimaginable, some, some form in which determinism and freedom are just one thing and I'm, I just hope one day it will hit me in the head and, <laughs> or, 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 or it will hit any one of us and we can share. I really look forward to that. Um, I want to really appreciate Paul for suggesting this uh, closing circle. That feels really good to me. Um, yeah, just sort of in the social culture of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the 90 minute is good. Um, we're overshooting that today. I, I think that um, I really appreciated having people to start the ball rolling. Um, Damian and Charles, thank you for that. Um, I like the idea of them coming together to maybe define common terms to start with or something like that. I think that could tighten it up just a little bit. Um, I think individual shares could perhaps be a little bit smaller and not as many pointed for me. And I don't assume this is true for others. um, But for me, sometimes having four or five significant or maybe three or four significant points made and then not necessarily followed up on became a little hard for me to hold as a container um, I like the idea of the initiators of the conversation um, going sort of back and forth and maybe a small round of looking for clarification to finish setting the stage and then having them drop out. Um, and it's, it's, there's lots of different ways to do it. They can stay on as kind of the, the sort of experts or whatever and respond to a lot of the questions. My personal preference is that uh, the conversation belongs to everyone afterwards. Um, and that's just my, my proclivity. Um, And my little mini personal uh, statement on on this free will uh, situation, I guess there's two things that occur to me. Um, One of them is that I see freedom uh, as a sort of a spectrum and not a binary. So sometimes when we're talking, we're saying, am I free or am I not free? And I see it more like, where am I free? Where do I have choice? And part of what's interesting to me when I think about like social systems, um, you know, equity or cont- contemplative internal practices, I think how can I increase my choices? How can I increase uh, the internal? Um, yeah, my world's going to my world's going to fail me that way. But how? Where can I increase choice? Um, and the other side is like defining freedom. Is it the freedom to act, or is it the freedom to produce an effect? Some people talk about freedom as like, I can create the impact I want. Other times, and when I say people, I don't mean you, I just mean in in general in society. Um, And other times I see people saying like, well, what is my internal capacity? So I think I'm saying the same thing here twice in in different words a little bit, but um, the more like, maybe I can't raise my hand because I don't have um, the uh, motor control to do that for whatever reason. But maybe if I even go closer and closer to myself, maybe I do have the ability to consider raising my hand, just as someone else might not realize they have the ability to consider changing their disposition or their mood or their emotional state. And so I'm curious about that. Like, how far out does it need to be for it to be considered freedom? And that's it. Oh, I wish you added more, Tim. That was uh, okay. I feel like I, I wanted to hear more of what you have to say. You have a, a nice way of putting things. Sorry for interrupting you, I appreciate Natalie. appreciate that. I'm kind of shy sometimes, so um, thank you for the encouragement. Um, I 
build on that just a little bit with uh, one thing that I didn't mention is including the integral perspective with how we understand freedom. For example, the um, magic stage has that wonder and the sense of unanswerable questions. The power stage is all about choice, but it's very impulsive. There's not freedom, it's just action, action. The conformist stage, we start to define the rules of the game and that's where determinism starts to come on play where we, we recognize there's a deterministic organization to will and free will. Um, at the linear achievement stage, we have um, the ability to stack the rules of the game for the first time and um, to choose specific outcomes over others. And at the inclusive stage, we have um, the ability to start accepting multiple outcomes. Um, we start to like fall in love with a sense of free will more at the, at the root, like what you were, what you were pointing to there, Tim, that, um, that sense of acceptance of, uh, the level that we have free will at the level of consciousness where we can make choices as how we can determine free will and acceptance. And that's basically then the integrals uh, second tier perspective where we define the context of what is our choice and what do we want to accept? Um, another way to say that a little bit more clearly is, um, we have choice over the level of context we want to accept or choose to have different um, at the integral stage. And so to take a little bit of self-responsibility for this conversation too, um, I feel like I've, I, I felt like disoriented at times. Like there's just so much that we could talk about, so many different threads that in order to um, make a point really clearly, it takes a little bit of effort on my part to, to filter out what's most relevant to the questions at hand. And so that's something that I'd like to work on. Um, it's uh, your suggestion of having shares be a little bit shorter um, feels, feels relevant to that. And also then I'll have to give up some of the, the flood of information that, that I love so much. Um, so. Thank you. Uh, I also appreciate how much everybody was agreeing and bringing their own perspectives. Thank you. Heidi, did you have any uh, closing remarks? I'm wondering if you can hear me. Yeah. Ah, okay, because here's everything frozen and uh, so I wasn't sure. Yeah, I found it really interesting um, to talk about. I, I uh oh, no internet connection there. Yeah, it says her mic is still off when it was on. I think her her she's lagging. She she lagged out. Okay. Well, as we're waiting for her, um, I'll just oh, well. That was weird. Oh, oh, she's gone. She's yeah. she's rebooting or something. It says, it says I am the host. I am the host now. <laughs> <laughs> this is my Machiavellian power grab move. I actually kicked her out in person. No, I'm kidding. Well, he's, I think, he's, in, I he's imposing weird. his he's imposing his will upon us. That's right. We're all prisoners. That's no, Ryan. I'm a lonely man. <laughs> I'm a lonely man. <laughs> We're puppets. <laughs> the truth is revealed. <laughs> um, but yeah, these are a lot of really excellent suggestions. I tried taking as many notes as possible, but I, I couldn't. So let, just email all of your uh, suggestions. Let's share them in the group email, and then we'll organize them in the beginning of next one. If next week works for people, we'll just iron out at the beginning again, kind of the structure, and uh, make sure we're all feeling good about that. Hi. Okay, buddy. So I await our next communication. I have to ring off pretty quick. I got another meeting this afternoon. Great, Charles. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, guys. Uh, Thanks, Charles. Thanks to everybody for this uh, wonderful experience. Till next time. Bye bye. Nice Take meeting care. you all. Bye. Take care, Mike. Take care. All right. All right. Good.